In ancient times, our ancestors knew of five far-off wandering bodies in the night sky. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, the planets. Aristarchus, and later Copernicus, realized that the Earth also orbits the Sun, and so was the sixth planet. The discovery of other planets would have to wait on the technological advancements brought on by the Enlightenment. The telescope allowed us to peer farther into the heavens, and in 1781, William Herschel made the first telescopic discovery of a previously unknown planet, Uranus. In 1821, French astronomer Alexei Bovard published tables he calculated for Uranus's orbit, and when subsequent observations disagreed with them, he theorized that an unknown body's gravity must be slightly shifting the orbit. In 1845 and 1846, French mathematician Urbain Le Verrier developed calculations for the orbit and current position of this unknown new body. When he was unable to convince the astronomers in his native France to search for it, he wrote to the Berlin Observatory, urging astronomer Johann Gall to take up the search with the observatory's large refractor telescope. The very first evening after receiving the letter, September 23, 1846, Gall spotted Neptune within one degree of Le Verrier's prediction, making it the first planet discovered by mathematical prediction rather than direct observation. No planet had been named since ancient times, and so there weren't any set rules for how to name one. Uranus was still called George at the time of Neptune's discovery, named after King George of England. Various names were suggested for this latest new planet, including Le Verrier, after the man who correctly predicted it. In the end, it was decided to continue with the ancient tradition of naming planets after ancient deities, and the planet was named for Neptune, god of the sea, the Roman counterpart of the Greek god Poseidon. It took a few decades for the name to catch on, but eventually it stuck. Only 17 days after the discovery of Neptune on October 10, 1846, British astronomer William Lassell discovered that this new planet had a companion. A large moon which, unlike every other body in the solar system, orbits its parent in a retrograde motion which means it goes backwards. This backwards orbit told astronomers that this moon was almost certainly captured by the planet's gravity rather than forming around it. The moon was eventually named Triton, after one of the sons of Poseidon. Neptune orbits 30 times farther from the sun than Earth, 2.8 billion miles, or 4.5 billion kilometers. And so it wasn't until well into the 20th century that we really knew much about it. A detailed understanding of the Neptunian system would have to wait for a closer encounter with a visitor from the planet Earth. In 1964, while working at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, engineer Gary Flandro was tasked with investigating ideas for the exploration of the outer planets. Flandro's work revealed that a rare alignment of the four gas giants would start in the late 1970s. This alignment only happens every 150 years or so, and if taken advantage of, would allow for a detailed reconnaissance of the outer solar system by using gravity assist to slingshot a robotic probe from one planet onto the next. This mission became known as the Planetary Grand Tour, and the spacecrafts were christened Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Voyager 1 flew by Jupiter and Saturn only, but Voyager 2 continued on to Uranus and in 1989 made its flyby of the Neptunian system. Voyager found Neptune a beautiful blue jewel floating in the heavens, so far out that the sun appears just a very bright star rather than the body that Neptune itself actually orbits. Voyager confirmed the suspected third moon, later named Larissa, and discovered five additional moons, Naiad, Thalassa, Despina, Galatia, and Proteus.
Since Voyager had no other planets to visit after Neptune, it was decided to use the planet's gravity to alter the course to visit one last body on its grand tour, Neptune's moon Triton. Triton, the coldest body in the solar system at negative 391 degrees Fahrenheit, or negative 235 degrees Celsius, is most likely a Kuiper Belt object which came too close to Neptune and got captured by the giant planet's gravity. Voyager's visit made Triton the first Kuiper Belt object that we had ever seen up close. We wouldn't see another until 2015 when New Horizons visited the Pluto system. Triton is 1,700 miles, or 2,700 kilometers in diameter. The surface is mostly frozen nitrogen, with traces of methane, and the crust is mostly water ice, and the core is thought to be rock and metal. It was assumed that a body this cold and remote would have no geologic activity at all but the Voyager team was astonished to see evidence of recent volcanic activity and then to actually see geysers of ammonia and water shooting eight kilometers up above the surface. Triton was not just a cold, dead world after all. And what of Neptune itself? We've been studying it for roughly 170 years now, with telescopes, robotic probes, and space telescopes. What have we learned about the furthest, coldest gas giant in our solar system? One year on Neptune is almost 165 years on Earth. Its day is only a little over 16 hours, which gives this world 89,666 Neptunian days in one Neptunian year. The diameter of the planet is 49,244 kilometers, or 30,599 miles, with a surface area roughly 15 times that of Earth and a volume almost 58 times Earth's. Because it is far less dense, however, its mass is only a little over 17 times that of Earth. From the cloud tops to the center of the planet, there are three main regions, the atmosphere, the mantle, and the core. The atmosphere makes up about 5 to 10 percent of the planet's mass, and it is about 80 percent hydrogen 19% helium, with the remaining 1% being traces of hydrocarbons such as methane. It is this methane in the atmosphere which gives Neptune its beautiful deep blue color. The atmosphere is striated into darker and lighter bands, with large storms such as the great dark spots forming and dissipating over time. In addition, there are white puffy clouds high in the upper atmosphere that often swirl around the edges of the storms. Winds in the upper atmosphere are the fastest in the solar system, reaching speeds of 1,300 miles per hour or 2,200 kilometers per hour. The mantle makes up about 60 to 90% of the mass of Neptune and this region alone is about 10 to 15 times the mass of Earth. The mantle is made up of ices of ammonia, water, and methane. In the midst of this region, over 7,000 kilometers down, there may be an area where methane decomposes into diamond crystals, and studies by the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory suggest there could be an ocean of liquid diamond with solid diamondbergs floating around in it. In the very heart of the planet is the core. It is estimated to make up about 7% of the mass of Neptune, and it is thought to be composed of silicates, 
nickel, and iron. Even at only 7% of Neptune's mass, it is still 20% more massive than Earth. Like all of the other gas giants in our solar system, Neptune is surrounded by planetary rings. A ring was suspected since 1968, and during Voyager 2's flyby, it found not one, but five main rings. From closest to Neptune to furthest, they have been named Gal, Le Verrier, Lassell, Arago, and Adams. Adams was found to be composed of five bright ring arcs set within a fainter ring. Unlike the bright water ice rings of Saturn, Neptune's much dimmer and smaller rings are composed mainly of dust and organic material. As for the formation of Neptune, that is still an ongoing puzzle. Planetary formation models don't show enough material that far out in the solar system to allow for the formation of large planets and yet Uranus and Neptune are obviously there. Current theory suggests that our two ice giants actually formed in closer to the Sun and then migrated outwards, perhaps by gravitational encounters with their larger neighbors, Jupiter and Saturn, combined with countless encounters with smaller bodies, eventually coming to a gravitational equilibrium in their current orbits. In 2011, Neptune finally completed one full year, or orbit around the Sun, since its discovery in 1846. In that time, it has gone from a mathematical prediction, to a faint point of light, to a real place that we have pictures of, a place with its own moons, rings, weather, and mystique. It has been shown to be a full, vibrant planetary system in its own right, full of wonders to admire and many more mysteries to explore. It seems poetically fitting that this beautiful planet, named after the Roman god of the sea long before anyone knew what it looked like, would turn out to be a gorgeous deep blue world, like an entire giant ocean planet for Neptune to rule over. <laughs>